Hello and welcome to Out of Spec Motoring. Today we are going to take a comprehensive look at one year of ownership with our Tesla Model 3 performance. Now we don't drive our cars like most Tesla owners. This is our road trip car and it's done about 60,000 miles of road tripping in just our one year of ownership. We have a lot to go through. You'll see little bars at the bottom of the video so you can jump to the sections you're interested in, but this took a lot of work, a lot of data gathering. This is about to be the most comprehensive overview I've ever done of a year of ownership. We're gonna look at the car's value. We're gonna look at the battery degradation. We're gonna look at the total cost of ownership. We're gonna look at the cosmetics of the car, how well it's held up. We're gonna pull the bottom bumper off and see how much dirt's in there. It's about to get pretty in-depth, and let's see if you guys like this stuff. Let's do it. Before we get into the car, I want to take a moment and thank all of our supporters on Patreon. Without you guys, many of you are Patreon supporters, these videos would not be possible to make. We have multiple channels, not just out of spec motoring. We have our newest and I think our most popular at some point, this will be is called One Lap, which is one lap of our track in a variety of different vehicles. We have a new video Monday, Thursday. We make all the videos for inside EVs, of course, and we also have out of spec reviews. So we're gonna be doing about nine videos a week here pretty soon. So please stay tuned to our channels. I'm gonna update our website at some point with everything that we're working on. But today's video is not all about that. It is about our 2019 Tesla Model 3 performance. This is the third Tesla I have owned. I had a Model S P100D. I had a Model 3 long range rear wheel drive, which I traded in on this car, which is our 2019 Tesla Model 3 performance. It is a midnight silver on white seat which I think a lot of people are interested to see how the white seats have held up. And this was a car I purchased the last day of September, 2019. And I'll go into some of the reasons that I did later on in this video, but there's a particular reason, one that stands out why I purchased this car in the end of September, 2019. I was sort of on the fence with my rear wheel drive, that car at 60,000 miles. I did a small, like one year update with that car, which has done really well. Hundreds of thousands of views on that video. People were really interested in it. Uh, I will link to that right over here or over here. I'm not sure which side of the screen, but basically you'll see a link to that somewhere. And, um, you know, I, I really liked that car. We took that car on a lot of trips. We set the electric cannonball record in that car, which we still hold amazingly. Uh, that car went all across the country. It did about 60,000 miles in one year of ownership. That's about what we put on our Tesla road trip car. And the reason to get the performance at the end of September was because free supercharging for two years was offered. Basically the last two weeks of the quarter, Tesla, I guess, needed to make their numbers. And they said, you know what, if you order and take delivery within this time frame, which was a really narrow time frame, you can do it. So I just said, you know what, we charge so much on the supercharger network. Um, and thankfully many of you have used our referral code. So we have a lot of miles that we're able to then use after our supercharging expires. We will use every single one of them, <laughs> but, uh, and we appreciate everyone who's used our referral code, but, uh, this car had two years free and there's something nice about plugging in charging and not even, you know, first off, not paying anything, but also not using supercharging miles. It's just pure free. And uh, for the amount that we road trip, that really adds up. It's probably in that $5,000 plus a year savings. So I said, you know what? That's 10 grand off the cars the way I looked at it and said, all right, let's just make the jump and get the performance. And then it's like, all right, we'll get the performance upgrades. We'll do everything. The only thing I did not get was full self driving. I still do not think it was worth the $7,000 at the time. And it's definitely not worth the $8,000 today. Now we'll see if there's more functionality that comes in the future, but again, it's not able to hit the car today. Therefore, I don't think it's uh, necessary to put it on a car that I'm not sure how long I'm gonna keep. If Tesla would say, hey, you can get full self-driving and we'll transfer it to your future vehicles, it is likely that we will always have at least one Tesla in the garage. As you guys know, we review all cars, not just Teslas. We had a Porsche Taycan last week, an Audi e-tron the week before that, a Nissan Leaf before that. We own a BMW i3, an electric smart car. We love all EVs, but 
For our trips, it's certainly nice using the supercharger network, and that's the main reason why we will likely have a Tesla in the driveway for many years to come. So if Tesla said, hey, buy full self-driving, go ahead and update that to every car in the future on your account, I'd say, you know what, I'd spend eight grand, maybe even 10 grand for that, uh, for that able to be transferred. So we'll see what happens with subscriptions in the future. These videos tend to do pretty well long into the future. So if you're watching this sometime after October 2020, full self-driving will probably be worth a little bit different. Um, now let's get into how this video is going to work. This is this was sort of the intro, introducing you to the car, what we're gonna be doing, and then we're gonna be doing all of the tests. A lot of this took a lot of time to compile all of the data. And I, we will also have a Q&A section at the end of this video where we literally received hundreds of messages in the last 12 hours through our Instagram, at Out of Spec Motoring, and on Twitter, at Out of Spec, with some underscores between each word, um, that basically ask a ton of questions. Many of them will be answered in the video anyway. Those that weren't, we'll get to at the end and feel free to skip through again through the chapters, which will be in the description and the bottom bar along the YouTube video. And now I'm gonna take you on a tour of the cosmetics. How is the car looking? How is it held up over this time? Um, this is the first section of the video I think it's gonna be the most interesting because what does a car look like after 60,000 miles of use in the real world with very little care given to it? So I'm gonna take you on a tour of the outside of the car, show you the bug guts, some of the scratches, some of the uh, battle scars it's accumulated. Then we're gonna put it up on a lift, look underneath the car, look at the plastic panels, look at the battery pack importantly, see how much dirt has accumulated underneath the rear bumper, we're gonna pull that down. And then I'm gonna show you the interior. Again, this car has the white seats. How is that held up? We've had muddy dogs in there, sand, we've been off-roading. Um, time for that section of the video. It's three parts, should be about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and talk about the cost. How much value has my car lost? And you join me here in my driveway to assess the cosmetic condition of the Model 3. Well, the first thing you'll notice is just the number of bug guts all over the place. And what we have going on here is the case of the car not being washed, uh, too often at least. And you can see some bird poop and other things. Now, the hood itself is not protected in any way. This is raw paint. And we did put some sort of uh, light ceramic coating, but it didn't really last that long. I'm sure it's not on there anymore. It's not a true ceramic coating. A true ceramic coating needs time to cure bake in and then that also needs maintenance to avoid water spots so if you really want to take car care properly which i certainly have done on other cars in the past this is not the way to do it but you can see a lot of these bug guts have come into the paint they've baked into the paint because we were out in 120 degree temperatures 125 degree temperatures out west in california in the desert and this is just what happens now these bug guts on the paint protection film which is only on the front bumper here they are all probably able to come off now we also did not protect that paint protection film with some sort of waxy coating or ceramic coating to fill up the porous nature of it so that paint protection film will probably need replacing at some point um, but personally i really don't care about it too much the bumper's totally fine underneath that's all i really care about i use it more as a functional protection than as a making the car look good now of course we have the martian mw03 wheels on the tesla my favorite wheels for teslas because they're extremely lightweight lightweight they add to the range especially on the performance cars that come on those 20 inch wheels if you throw a set of these on there it's significantly less consumption so these are our road trip setup and uh, we also have the narrowest uh, wheel selection these are 18 by seven and a half and we run well, typically I would have put a nicer tire on for the trip, but this uh, summer trip that we took in this car was a 15,000 mile trip that um, we put on these uh, $50 tires because that's what we run on the track when we're drifting around. Another benefit of those narrow wheels like these 18 by 7.5s are there's less grip so you can slide more easily and at lower speeds. So it just worked out that we had those tires on for the trip. Now this piece of glass was cracked it was 944 dollars to get a new piece of glass that did not include the tint 
that I need to have tinted on the inside. I like to do a 80% tint, or is it a 20% tint? Anyway, 80%, I think it's a lighter tint, but a, but a ceramic tint with UV and IR rejection. Really keeps the interior cooler. It also saves your eyes a little bit of wear. So I'm a big fan of that. You can see here the Tesla crossbars. I think I'm gonna leave them on there. We put them on so we could have our Yakima Grand Tour 16 box on like we did for our summer road trip expedition but uh, they look pretty good they definitely need to be clean just covered in bug guts from 15,000 miles of road tripping you can see especially with the grand tour 16 box it forced a lot of the bugs into the glass here this is all easily uh, able to be cleaned i just haven't had a chance since our trip we've been working every day on reviewing cars for out of spec and others so uh, this will get fixed but the nice thing is glass and paint the paint definitely will need a polish a little bit of paint correction because we have some scratches down the side of the car from off-roading you really can't see it unless you get up close to it but other than that this is a ding in the rear door my friend Christoph from Porsche engineering slammed this door in you know they really like their Tycons he got in the three and was upset no I'm joking but uh, yeah this he offered to fix I just it doesn't really bother me that much it's through the paint but it's been like that since I don't know eight months now not a big deal Here's the out of spec. You can order your out of spec track stickers on our website, of course. They are now stocked and ready to go. And the back of the car, my registration has expired, which means I need to get a new one. I've been kind of lazy on that. It's all, uh, it's one day expired, it's October 1st, so no big deal. I will have to go to DMV or I guess I can mail it in, I don't know. I'll have to figure that one out. But yeah, the rest of the outside of the car looks fairly good. Everything's replaceable. Uh, that's sort of broken. The spoiler's kind of lifting in the edges here. You can see this glue's come off. I asked Tesla about it. They said, well, we could put a new one on for $850 or something. I said, uh, no, I'll just deal with it. It's lifting on both sides. And uh, nothing a little bit of 3M tape can't fix. So doesn't bother me in any way. Uh, fit and finish on this car was really good from the factory. Very few defects. Uh, you can see some of this light scratching here from off-roading. Again, it will definitely need a polish uh, and probably a compound in some places. The brake discs themselves are all warped from our track use. Again, this car gets thrown around the racetrack quite aggressively without proper warm-up for the brakes, so they tend to warp very quickly. And uh, after 60,000 miles, if you slam on the brakes at, you know, 130 miles an hour, it rumbles, rumbles pretty bad. So that's something we'll have to look into and probably upgrade the brakes while we're at it. And the autopilot cameras are all great, all clear. Never had an issue with the autopilot cameras on this car. And other than that, the exterior looks pretty good before we jump to the interior let's look underneath the car see how much dirt's accumulated in the rear bumper my guess is a lot but we'll have to see and then we will assess the interior's condition and now it is time to put the car on the lift and see how it looks underneath so let's get this thing loaded up and we'll take a look underneath the car and see if there's any big damage make sure we don't drive off do our best if we hear a big loud crash then we know we've done something wrong uh big guessing game here and i guess that's probably pretty good let's take a look i'd say it looks pretty good definitely on the lift now when i lift this up something to keep in mind is this car has been hit the battery pack has been scraped we've been off-roading in moab this car has been bottomed out it has not been taken care of under there i scraped the front of it although even though it is curved up which is very nice occasionally you just get those steep driveways that you curb so uh, or i should say that you scrape underneath the front splitter so let's get it up on the lift and look underneath All right, here's our trusty three up on the lift. Let's take a look. I'm sure it's pretty echoing, echoey in here. You're going to look first time with me here. Well, the first thing you'll notice is some of my paint protection film here on the front peeling up. And I guess that's to be expected. But I would say that's probably down to the install work not being amazing. It wasn't terrible, but uh, you can definitely see it bubbling up in certain areas. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just happens with paint protection film. You can see this car only has paint protection film in the front and some other high impact areas. So here, for example, it's just covered in bugs. I never treated the paint protection film properly. I have a rock right here. Um, 
Yeah, we'll just let that go over here. Uh, so that way, you know, unfortunately these bugs are kind of baked into there. I just never ceramic coated the car or did anything like that. Um, so if you care about your car's paint, definitely don't follow what I did on this car. I used to go crazy on paint, just not the case here. So now we come a little deeper and you can see all of the dirt embedded in here. Some of these scratches I was talking about, but nothing major, nothing that would indicate that like there's something damaged yet. You can see the speaker holes for the reversing speaker. Again, when this car was new, it was one of the first ones with the reversing speaker. And uh, let's take a look a little farther under here. And this seems to be some of the worst of the damage, but this is just a cheap, you know, plastic piece. This doesn't really matter, but see just scrape marks all around. Zoom in on some of this looking here, but this is probably a 10 or $15 piece of plastic. Uh, nothing that would concern me yet. I'd say it all looks pretty good. Again, we're not to the battery. Taking a look here at the lower control arms, the inside of the brakes, everything looks totally normal considering the use that this car has had, which has been drifted around the track over here. Uh, yeah, bushings over here all look pretty good. Nothing's torn, nothing's cracked. CVs, nothing's leaking. Nothing's leaking on this side either. So I'd say so far pretty good considering the abuse that that front end has had. And now we get back to the battery pack. Let me kick on the lights here. Just flip this little switch. Oop. Now we have some cool under lighting, uh, but I am gonna pull this centerpiece back so we can see the battery in better detail. So this is an alignment rack as well as a lift that we use it for, okay. so. Let's take a look from this direction here. This is that same plastic piece we've been eyeing towards the front of the car. Again, just holes all pretty good. Nothing major, no damage. They're actually surprised that's still attached. And here we get to our battery pack. And um, let's see, all seems to be okay. Some surface scratches so far. Let me zoom out so you can see. So we have this uh, trailing edge here, which is super, um, important it's a piece of metal of course it's a protection that is scraped up you can see some of these hard hits that we've taken all throughout here and then we have some minor surface scratches you can see this is a solid solid piece nothing hollow about that at all um, yeah you can see just these scratches down the side of it from us going so far nothing major this whole metal piece is still intact all of our bolts down the center are still intact. Everything is looking fairly good. Let's take a look at the sides of the car on our way back. We can see some, just some debris left in here. We also have all of our jacking points, these little holes all look normal. These plastic sides, of course, you can see up through here. Let me zoom in on that. They're all scratched up. They look bad, but again, they're all there for protection. So nothing major so far. Let's move this back and let's continue to look under the rear of the car. Now we're facing the back end of the battery pack. Uh, again, it all looks fairly good back here from the battery side, just cosmetic scratches. Nothing that would concern me, nothing that would indicate a breach. And again, we've had this car teetering on pebbles and sharp rocks. It's pretty amazing actually. And now let's take a look under the back here. We have just dirt and junk but even these plastic pieces look great. You can see a couple uh, dents and things for some scrape marks. Same on this side, nothing leaking, everything's looking good. These, uh, I think we're supposed to have plastic covers under here perhaps. Maybe not, maybe it's just the Model Y, but they're definitely not there on this car. But again, everything's totally intact. I do wanna take this panel off, see how much dirt has accumulated under here. So that's our next plan. But seriously, yeah, this thing, you can see the back of it here, looks honestly not nearly as bad as I expected it to. It's just cosmetic scratches, pretty nice. Now let's take a look underneath this rear panel right here. This is where some dirt and stuff collects. So we're gonna turn both of these bolts to the left and it might get real messy or it might be nothing. Of course, everyone jokes about Model 3s having uh, their bumpers fall off whenever they hit rain. That's never happened and I've driven through some crazy flooded areas in this car. 
but what we've also done is a lot of dirt roads, a lot of mud. This thing's used its four-wheel drive system for true four-wheel drive. Now is the moment of truth. Is it gonna be filled with stuff? Oh, I already see things falling. Uh, no, no, there's nothing. Do I need to remove this whole panel? Let's remove the whole panel and see what happens. <laughs> All right, well, I just found after like 30 minutes a 10 millimeter socket. No, I'm joking. I actually, this was the first time in my life I found a 10 millimeter quite easily. Uh, let's take this whole panel off. There's one, two, three, four, five, six bolts. And let's see what's under here. This is a, a hugely requested item actually on our channel. So let's do it. All right, last bolt, and I'm already getting stuff falling down through here. I have a bucket down here. I'm hoping I can collect all the dirt and weigh the bucket. Oh, it's really not bad in there. I'm not gonna even take the whole thing off. I mean, I guess I didn't realize this trunk was actually looking in, but look, I think everything has fallen out. It might've just been on older Model 3s. Let me see if you can see in there. Pretty much nothing. It looks really good. Like literally just a couple, like look, it's just a couple rocks are falling out, but like nothing major. That's, it's all, seemingly up under here honestly but yeah just dust huh so that was a surprise to me and also why we do these tests now it's time to button this all back up get the bolts back in and we'll move on to the next section of the video but I think you found the underside of the car is cosmetically damaged uh, by just scratches and dirt and things like this but uh, in, in practicality, nothing was damaged. Everything's full functioning order. And honestly, it looks totally fine under here. Nothing that would even be considered damage to me or a normal person. It's just some light scrape marks. So go drive your cars off-road, Model Y owners. Model 3 owners, don't worry about speed bumps. Just rip it. And now it's time to assess the interior's condition. Now this, be prepared. We have a lot of dog hair everywhere. The dogs ride around with us on our trips. And again, this is sort of our work vehicle, more or less. They just come with us when we throw them in. We have not tried to take care of this interior in any way. And it's a good test for the white seats as well, because again, we've had muddy dogs, we've had drink spill, we've had French fries, we've had you name it, and this seat has had to take it and then uh, be cleaned. However, I have not cleaned these seats in over 30 thousand miles the last time i cleaned the seats was at thirty thousand miles and they came back to brand new white which is pretty amazing so i was planning on cleaning the seats in this video so you can see the difference however i don't have any of my microfiber towels we have just moved i can't find anything so they still look pretty good a couple little things here or there something i may do for a video on our instagram or twitter so follow that and stay tuned and you can see the before and after it'll be probably pretty satisfying to watch them get cleaned. For now though, let me take you on a tour. So you're gonna be looking at my car as is. I haven't cleaned anything out for you and it's a disaster. You have Starbucks cups, you have receipts on the floor. These are the awesome Evan X floor mats, by the way, I really like these floor mats. You can see the seats show no signs of wear on the edges of getting in and out constantly. Again, we have a lot of different people driving this car. We have our videographers in and out of it. Alyssa drives it, I drive it. You can see staining on the seats from drinks being spilled all down through here. But again, nothing that is that major. Now what you can do is keep unscented baby wipes in the car and that's a great way to keep these seats clean. But seriously, they still look really good. Now, we have a lot of dust and dirt all through these uh, vents here, just from going in El Mirage and dry lake beds and the salt flats. And yeah, but overall, not bad. There are a couple issues though. Let me take you around and show you those. The first issue happened on day two of ownership, and that was Blue in the back seat, our big Great Dane mix, who wanted to get out and scratched up this piece all through here. I don't know if you can see, but it doesn't really bother us, but that was like, okay, 
day two cars ruined just drive it normally we have uh, muddy paw prints from the car from the dogs getting in and out of the car here chatamo adapter of course just laying around and back here is where things happened very poorly so the dogs ride around in the trunk and they don't just stay in the trunk of course we put the seats down so they have access we would never just put them in the trunk normally uh or i should say with the seats up but they get access to the back so that's why you can see ellie's dog hair everywhere but you can notice under here there's no carpeting and that is because it's in the dumpster uh really nasty but we had a 24 pack of bud light explode back here and i didn't realize it and since i don't drive the car during the week it pretty much sits here baking in the sun and we had maggots in the carpets and it smelled awful and we had to ozone the interior many times and now it smells totally fine no issue except i just threw out those carpets and forgot to ask tesla to see how much it was to put a new one in but you can see all this dirt and junk from driving on all those dirt roads all around the car now inside here let me take you on a little tour you can see the seat backs have muddy paw prints you can see dog hair all over the roof <laughs> it's in serious need of a detail in here but again we use this car just as a normal vehicle this isn't really anything that we treat to be that special there's nose prints and stuff all over the windows from the dogs looking out and i don't know if you can see but on the dashboard right here there we go blue also tried to get out and scratched the top black piece of the dashboard it's nothing minor very surface level scratches but yeah that's about it and then of course all of the boot marks all over the glass <laughs> but look seriously 60,000 miles with white seats and heavy heavy use seriously heavy use we've had this car packed with stuff again we've had mud dirt sand dogs you name it and it's great nothing that wouldn't be able just to be wiped up and cleaned off that's why i love white seats and i would always get them on every tesla people think we're crazy but they come back to looking brand new with just a wipe down of dawn dish soap that's warm and a microfiber because it's not leather you don't need to treat and condition it and you don't want to use anything abrasive on this material because it will eat away at the coating so definitely the the interior to get in my opinion and it certainly makes the car feel a lot more airy inside. So actually pretty well. The car looks great all around. I mean, a couple little dings and dents. It could use a detail, it could use paint protection. Uh, sorry, it has paint protection. It could use paint correction to get all those bug guts and scratches out of the paint, but nothing that's not repairable. Uh, so I'd say it's looking pretty good and overall pretty fine. Um, definitely better than our black model three did after 60,000 miles. And that's just down to the black paint that had uh, pitting on the, uh, wheel arches and stuff from all the rocks, this car, nothing really major like that. So that's pretty good and pretty impressive, especially considering we've been rallying this thing on dirt roads. But now it's time to see how much value it has lost in one year and 58,568 miles of use. And the first place we're going to stop is Kelly Blue Book. Now, the thing I like about Kelly Blue Book is uh, they will give you a relative trade-in estimate and then a private party sale. The thing I don't like about Kelly Blue Book is they're not the ones putting up the money to buy your car. So it's not actually what it's worth. It's just a range, but let, that's a good starting point. Um, there's a few different conditions I can put in the car. I've loaded up the spec and the mileage in here, and I've said it's in good condition. I wouldn't say it's excellent, um, but I'd say it's, it's good. It's normal use. It seems fine. And on a trade in, which is, let's say I wanted to just drop it off at a dealer and drive home something else. They're going to give you sometimes at auction value or slightly below auction value. And KBB says that should range from 35,347 to 39,009. Now let's take a look back and see what I paid for this car originally. And when I pull up that document, you can see I paid $59,190 for this car. Uh, it has a $15,000 option of getting the big battery all wheel drive performance. I got black and white seats, uh, which is the white interior. I got midnight silver. And then I went for the performance upgrades, which was $6,000. Looking back, I think I would have been fine with a stealth. All I really wanted was track mode. 
Uh, we weren't a hundred percent certain if stealths had track mode back then. And, um, because this car does see a lot of use on our track, which I'm sure you all know, uh, it goes out there at least two or three days a week, which is why I put those cheap tires on because we're just tearing it up. Uh, so let's see, that's 59, 190. Let's assume that my trade in values around 35,000. I don't, I mean, th that's what a dealer would pay for it. Uh, that's $24,190 of loss in my one year of ownership. Now, keep in mind, I also had to pay tax on that 59,190. Um, and so that I didn't get any tax credits because they were already expired. So, ouch. Um, and you know, you could say, well, think about all the fuel savings that you would have got, but I was already driving an electric car. I've been driving electric cars for years. So <laughs> the fuel savings isn't really there. And like, maybe I would have had to pay for supercharging on my rear wheel drive three, but I have enough referrals where I probably would not have had to. And so, yeah, that's a big loss, 25 grand roughly in one year. So that's what KBB thinks uh, my value should be worth. Let's take a look to see what some others are. Now, the biggest uh, trade-in companies I can think of that are coming up to make the process easy, you have CarMax, you have Carvana, you have Vroom, you have Current Automotive, which just does electric cars. They're based in Illinois. Um, so there's a lot of services, but I, I said, let's look at Carvana and let's look at Vroom. These are companies that will show up at your house, cut you a check and take the car away. So this is, they're putting up their own money to buy my car. Now I go to Carvana. Ouch. They say they would pay me $28,579 for my car. Now I would be so stupid to trade it into them. I would sell it private party for, let's say a little bit more. We'll look into that in a second, but this is what they are offering. And they say that my car actually is worth 34,800, but because I live in Eastern North Carolina, my local market is almost a $6,000 reduction. So I would just say I live in a different place, drive it to a friend's house in Denver or LA or wherever and make up that $6,000 difference. <laughs> and then they also gave me a negative $500 or $500 off their value due to the physical condition of the car because I did put in, yes, there's minor dings and scratches. And so um, they're saying that it's 28,579 is their offer. That's pretty poor. Um, Let's take a look at Vroom. Let's see what they would give me for my car. So Vroom, uh, again, you, sometimes I've seen Carvana to be way better than Vroom. And traditionally that seems to be the case from what I've seen. And sometimes I've seen Vroom be way better than Carvana in this case. And Vroom says they'll pay me with their money. Uh, they will pay me $36,000 even for my car. That's not too bad. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. Um, and of course, I don't know what the private party purchase is because the car is only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. Now, has someone seen the car being flung around the racetrack and gone on these trips and said, hey, that's the car from YouTube, I want that one. Or are they gonna say, I know what that car has been through and I don't want that one. Um, I would say we actually take really good care of the car from a battery perspective. We'll get into that in a little bit so they would know the history, but I don't know. That's, that's something that I guess would be on an individual basis. So let's go back to KBB and look at our private party value. What would my car be worth if I was to list it for sale and expect to get for value? And they say it ranges from 39 to 43 and a half or so. And they say right in the middle is 41,684. So if we take a look at the value my car has lost from $41,684 worth today, that would be $17,506 of depreciation in one year and 60,000 miles. Now, that doesn't seem too bad to me. Uh, if you look at any comparable car, such as a BMW 340i or a C43 AMG or something like this, uh, they would probably lose seventeen dollars to $20,000 in that first year and, and probably more with 60,000 miles. So I would say my value retention is not terrible, but it's not great. My rear wheel drive model three, I traded in at the same time of ownership as this at one year and roughly 60,000 miles. I think it was 59,000 instead of 58, seven, but roughly the same mileage. And they gave me 40, no, they gave me $35,000 even on a trade in. 
So one year ago today, a rear wheel drive with the same conditions was worth more than a performance car is one year later. So the depreciation hit on this car is significantly higher than the rear wheel drive three. And I've seen quotes out there of people saying, oh, Teslas hold their value so well, Model 3s really do. And that's possible, but not if you drive a lot. Any mileage will depreciate a car massively. The use on my vehicle, of course, is not traditional. So I'm sure a normal one holds their value quite well but I think a standard plus will probably have the lowest depreciation or even a Model 3 standard uh, range would because the performance cars, they cost more, you're spending more money up front, you're gonna lose it. Nothing dissimilar here from any other car brand. So you've seen the cost, uh, roughly 17 to $24,000 in lost value. Let's just assume I've lost 20 grand in my first year of ownership to depreciation. And now it's time to talk about the car's service history. This car has been into service three times in my one year, and I'm going to pull up why. I don't even remember why, to be honest. So let's pull it up. We have our first one here, which is a uh, front dash trim piece rattled like crazy. They charged me $8.75 for this uh, because I don't actually even remember this. I don't know why that wouldn't be covered under warranty, but they didn't, uh, whatever, eight bucks, no big deal. We had uh, window, wind noise. I remember bringing it in and I still hear the wind noise just a little bit coming out of the driver window, but it, I've honestly gotten used to it. Um, let's see, oh, I had issues with V3 supercharges after that Las Vegas video I did. Nothing wrong with my car, it was the station. I think I just let them know. And, um, this was interesting and it hasn't happened much, but maybe that now that we're getting to cold weather, it will because they removed the battery blanket on the car, uh, which my rear wheel drive model three had, it's like a little buffer between the floor and the battery. When there's big temperature variations or pressure changes, the battery's metal expands and pops. And this was like a big thing and everyone was concerned. And I had read somewhere that, that they had upgraded the breathers in the battery pack to allow the change of pressure uh, easier into the battery without this metal expanding. And so they updated my car to the newer breathers. But even then going up steep hills, I heard a lot of banging. Uh, this summer we didn't really hear any of that and we, co we covered a lot of transitions. So perhaps this fix worked, although we'll see this winter because it usually happens in cold weather. And I had to get a new key card. So that's that one. The next one, let's see what it is. This is fun for me. I really have no idea. The next one is tires and wheels. Oh, they put on my referral wheels. So that's not a service appointment. Uh, that was just them. And thank you guys for using my referral code. They gave me free wheels. So it's been in for service once so far. The next one is, let's see. Uh, driver's door handle doesn't return to resting. Oh, this was my recent one. And I don't know why there's two markings for it, but I know it, that that was supposed to be one. This was my driver door handle was sticky. My rear spoiler was lifting, which again, I spoke about when we did the exterior walk around. Uh, the passenger seat controls were broken and I needed a new windshield. So all they were able to do out of that whole visit was replace my windshield. I think they either forgot or the other components were too expensive, such as $800 for a new spoiler when I can just tape it down a little bit more. Um, and that's it, two service visits, really nothing major. I think really, let's say the only two problems that were really uh, necessitated a service visit from a manufacturer defect problem would be the uh, battery banging and the front uh, latches and the uh, rattle in the front dashboard. I will say that brings up a, a sparks my memory here. Our glove box just falls down. The struts are gone on it, but not worth fixing because I never opened that. So that's the service. Pretty much nothing. It's had zero maintenance and it's been relatively flawless. And yeah, I guess one of those times they gave me free wheels. Thanks, Tesla. And if you're wondering where you can get these super awesome out of spec sweatshirts in YouTube, right below our video, we have these for sale along with other stickers and things like this. But now it's time to get into my favorite topic, which is the data on the vehicle. So the way that I have tracked everything is through Teslify. Now you guys all know I use Teslify for 
every Tesla I've owned, all of my family uses it. We love the data. It basically, from the second this car left the Raleigh showroom where I took delivery the last day of September 2019, this car has logged every single mile, every charging session, everything it's done, everywhere it's gone in this awesome application. So this is where I really love this kind of stuff. Let's dig into it. All right, let's load up Teslify. Here we go. And uh, first off, you can see what the car is doing right now, which is great. So this is not an advertisement for Teslify in any way, just so you know. I just happen to love their service and this is what we're gonna use to assess the usage on the car. Um, so you can see our charger is disconnected. We're at 75% state of charge. Our odometer, 58,568.39 miles. Love that. You can see the temperatures. You can see our rated range on the vehicle, 214.64 miles at 75%, our estimated range 203.85 miles based off of my previous driving history, and you can see it's sleeping and the doors are unlocked. Anyway, here's what I did. Basically, I went out to Starbucks today, it took me 12 minutes, I used 2% of my battery, and you can see all of the statistics about this drive. I can dig in and see it even way more. So you can see GPS of each location I went, the elevation, the battery level, the outside temp, in time set, the <laughs> inside temp, my fan status, my speed, my gear position, coordinates, really amazing stuff, love this. But let's go into first our charges because what goes into a car a lot with an EV is how have you charged the car and at what levels and at what speed. And when we talk a little bit later in this video, our degradation test, uh, a lot of that plays into is how was the car charged? Now, if you supercharge a car to 100%, all the time and drain it to zero and let it sit there, that's really hard on a battery pack. How does that affect degradation? Honestly, I don't know for sure because we've never run two cars in the same environments with different charging habits. It's just almost an impossible test to run in the real world. And so I would say I've done what I think is best for this car. Now, just so you know, my charging habits is whenever I have the opportunity, I have this car on AC charging. That's level two charging or even level one charging. Uh, overnight, I charge here at, uh, at our home. We have destination chargers for free. Uh, at our previous house where this car lived most of the time, I had destination chargers or wall connectors in my garage that I would just plug into. Um, and I typically charge this car between 70 and 80% daily. Very rarely, very rarely does it ever see more than 80% on a daily basis. And that's just to save the battery some wear. Lithium's happiest between 25 and 50% state of charge. So when I go on a long trip without the car, I plug it in and leave it plugged in at 50% state of charge. So this car I think has been really well cared for from a battery maintenance perspective. Now, we also take a lot of long trips. We go very long distances. It gets a lot of supercharging. We have to charge it up high to make some stretches. And in that case, it's been full charged a few times on AC and DC. It's been drained to zero a ton because it's the fastest way to travel is to pull into a supercharger dead and ride your charging curve all the way up. So much of our DC charging is not slow DC charging. It's 150, 250 kilowatt going into this car. And so while we do take really good care of it as much as possible, I don't alter our travel plans or slow down in any way to protect the battery. We, we use this car to its full capability when we're road tripping. So now let's take a look at some of our charges, which is cool. It breaks it down by location. It shows how many kilowatt hours we've added and how many kilowatt hours we have used. So what this is, is added to the battery pack and used from the wall. The rest is burnt off as loss, heat loss typically. And um, so you can see here the average percentage. Now, if you look here at this Marco Island, which is where my family has a little condo down there, we only have access to 110 volt charging, a regular wall outlet. And you can see the efficiency of our charging is significantly less than the 90 plus percent of the other locations. And that's because when you're charging on 110, it's not nearly as efficient as 240. Pumps have to run longer, you know, you don't have higher voltage. And so therefore the efficiency is less. I love that you can see all this stuff. So you can see everywhere I've charged, I've put in the, the cost of home charging at my previous house, which is pretty much the only place I've ever paid for AC charging, which was $390 over the entire car's life. And um, 
Now we're gonna go down, you can see I've plugged in pretty much any opportunity, this is all AC charges. And it's done 515 AC charges. It's been plugged in at 66 different locations. And we have added to the battery pack 8.3 megawatt hours or 8,316.84 kilowatt hours. But of course, one megawatt hour is 1,000 kilowatt hours to the battery pack. And we have taken 8.7 kilowatt hours from the wall. So the 8.7 is what the cost savings is based off of, of course, because that's what's run out of the plug. That difference is heat loss. And uh, you can see it's been charging for 56 days, 17 hours, 30 minutes continuous. That's a lot, that's pretty cool. And uh, based off of my home electricity rates for AC, the car, which I think I put in 11 cents a kilowatt hour, could be wrong, uh, estimates I've saved 574 point nine four dollars now we get into supercharging and this again supercharging i only use when we are road tripping it is not my daily source of charging um you know i try to protect the battery by supercharging as little as possible now in practicality does it make a difference i don't know i haven't seen the data there to show it makes a huge difference but i just feel good about ac charging the car uh, Interesting to note though, is the savings of supercharging is not actual supercharging cost savings. This, this system cannot uh, quantify that. What it is doing is it is calculating based off of my home electricity rates, how much I would have saved. But supercharging of course is a lot more expensive than the savings tab that you'll see over here. Anyway, you can see all of the superchargers that the car has been to the amount of time cumulatively that it's spent at that charger and the average time across all charging sessions at that particular charger. And so Raleigh, it's been to 21 times. And why would I do that? I lived in Raleigh. Well, we would go out of town, we'd come back dead. There was a target there. It was all opportunity charging or charging up. But again, not my daily source of charging, but still 21 times is a lot to supercharge in Raleigh. Now that we live in Rocky Mount, we go into Raleigh. Sometimes we have to charge up we just use it a lot. Uh, and then of course you can see, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other locations uh, ranging all across the country. Cause again, this car's done three or four cross country trips. We'll talk about that in a second. So here are all the superchargers it's been to, <laughs> which is just crazy. And it's been to 218 supercharging locations. Uh, and that's just this car. Of course, we've had the other ones that have done you know, probably about the same in their road trips. So I've been to a lot of superchargers. There's very few that I haven't been to actually. And so it's been supercharged 376 times at 218 locations and the car has added 12.1 megawatt hours to the battery pack. A lot of people will assume, including me, that DC charging is harder on the battery pack than AC charging, but this is a hot topic. I'd be curious to see what you think in the comments below. I'm no battery expert, I'm not a chemist, uh, but I would think all of the heat of pumping in 250 kilowatts into the battery pack or 150 kilowatts in many places does degrade the battery faster. And we'll see that when we do our degradation test at the end, we'll see if that's the case. Uh, I have cumulatively supercharged for five days, 17 hours and 40 minutes. Let's think about that. I have spent almost a week at a supercharger, but in actuality, that's not that bad considering the amount of time that we spend on the road. Our average supercharging session across all sessions, including the ones where I charge to 100% for tests, where we plug in longer than we need to is only 21 minutes. And I would say on a road trip, it is significantly less. We typically spend 15 to 18 minutes uh, with the roof box on the car and maybe 12 to 15 minutes without the roof box on the car to make it to the next supercharger. And that is the fastest way to travel is to hop charger to charger, uh, basically charge until your car tapers and see if you can make it to the next supercharger. And that's how we were able to set the cannonball record, the methods proven, uh, as long as there's plenty of chargers. So that's uh, for supercharging. Now these are all of my Chatamo charges and many of these are opportunity charging, of course. We show up at a location where we're testing another car with CCS. We have this car in tow for our uh, filming vehicle. We just plug in to a Chatamo station because that happens many times. A few times though, such as this one here in Minot, North Dakota, we needed these Chatamo chargers. So I would never have a Tesla without a Chatamo adapter. One thing I would really, really love to see 
is Tesla give us a CCS adapter that's capable of 200 plus kilowatt. Uh, it's definitely needed. The network is getting so much better. I just took an Audi e-tron on a massive trip all around like the middle of nowhere, like into Kentucky and West Virginia, and it was no problem getting around with that car. So um, the CCS network's getting built out by ChargePoint, EVgo, Electrify America, Green Lots, you name it. Uh, they are putting in a ton of stations and I'd love to have an adapter to use those quickly because 50 kilowatt, 125 amp pack voltage on the Chatamo, it's so slow. It barely, you know, it just trickle charges the car. We need 200 kilowatt, I'd say, is, is going to be the new norm. I know I push for really fast charging, but I road trip a lot. I love to have fast charging. So now we get to our total AC and DC charge totals. So we've charged 8.3 megawatt hours on AC. We've charged 12.6 megawatt hours on DC. Um, again, these total savings are based off of home electricity rates. That supercharger rate probably in the one year has saved us between five and $7,000, maybe more of free supercharging on this car. Again, that's the reason why I got this car was because of the free supercharging. Um, that's just what threw me over the edge. I didn't buy it for that, but I was like, all right, that's the last little push that I need because we use it. So many people overvalue free supercharging because you charge it home 99% of the time. Most people don't road trip like we do. And it really doesn't save you that much money. I mean, a supercharger is anywhere from $4 to 15 or 20 bucks on the high side when you charge a car there. Um, but, but for us constantly road tripping that it really does add up the costs. And then our total charges all cumulatively is about 21 megawatt hours gone into that battery pack, uh, over 62 days, 23 hours, 30 minutes. And, um, that's a lot of charging for one year. So we use about 20 megawatt hours a year of charging and sorry to the electric grid for that. Now let's take a look at where we have driven this car over its time. And sometimes it takes a little while for this system to accumulate and compile all of the data. So while it's doing that, we should talk about where this car has been. Um, we live here in North Carolina, of course. So much of our driving is long distance around the East Coast. So we go from here to DC to Florida. Often I go uh, out West. Uh, I think this car has gone on three cross country road trips now, full cross country trips. And, um, yeah, it's been amazing. A lot of this was done this summer, of course, that North Dakota leg up to Montana. That's all from this road trip. And keep in mind, all of these charging totals that we just went through and this driving data that we're going through is time that the car has spent in cell data able to transmit. You can see here our odometer is 58,568 but it's only logged 57,508 miles here. So there's a thousand miles that are not logged and actually a few charging sessions when we were in national parks and things like that, where the car had no cell connectivity to transmit data. And I haven't gone out of my way to log all of that. And so um, let's take a look here. It says our watt hour per mile average is 332. I believe that matches what our lifetime is in the car. I believe that says 333. Nearest makes no difference. We had Tesla Fi calibrated to match our in-cars consumption readings so that it all works out. But let's take a look at this map because this is super interesting. You can see we've done plenty of these Florida trips down to Miami, over to Marco Island where I was saying we have a, a, a family home. You can see uh, one of these trips, Don and I went out to Austin, we came back, we did this cross country trip, we did another one, we went up to North Dakota, we did Colorado much of the time, we were looking to move to Colorado, so we spend a lot of time in and around Denver and Fort Collins. So if you're out there, let us know. We'd love to meet some of you guys because we don't really know anyone out there, we just love it. So yeah, awesome. We spent time in the California desert in Death Valley down here. The car's been to Vegas a few times and uh, it's been all around the country. Now, interestingly, it's never been up to New York, Connecticut, or New England. That's where I grew up in Connecticut. And um, what that's kind of interesting because I drive up there all the time, but I guess I've just never taken this car. Keep in mind, we get a new car or two to review every single week. So I'm typically driving press cars, not my car during the week. This is just for a road tripper. And um, I guess when I have to pop up to New York or Connecticut, I take another car. Uh, we've done a couple road trips up there. One of them was in my dad's Model S. 
yeah, so this car hasn't been to the Northeast yet, which is interesting because compared to my rear wheel drive Model 3, which I believe I can overlay here on this screen, uh, that car has been all over the Northeast. That car has been everywhere. And of course, cross country trips. And this is what I love about Teslify. It's just so data rich. It logs everything. And so here you can see the data overlay of both Beak, which is our performance, and Sky Crew, which was the rear wheel drive, our last Tesla. And I didn't log it on my Model S. I didn't know about Teslify back then. And so you can see Beak's been, of course, been up to New Hampshire. It's been to Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Vermont, all around. Actually, that car hadn't been to Vermont, uh, but it'd been to Maine. It's been all around. And the blue lines are all for Beak. So the rear wheel drive, I only did one cross country trip in. That was the Cannonball record. Went home through Denver, of course and many trips to Florida, Atlanta, et cetera. So lots of driving in Teslas, and uh, we, we love to road trip these cars. That is, I, I firmly believe these are the best road tripping cars on the market uh, because of autopilot being so great, because of uh, supercharging being so fast and a great way to just get out of the car for 10, 15 minutes every two hours or so. It really keeps the trip pace going. You're never just sitting there trying to bomb from A to B for hours on end. There's some other cool things that Teslify can show you as well, such as software updates. You can see here every single software update that I've received. I've received 24 different versions of software in my one year of ownership, averaging 15 days between updates. Uh, and it's taken me an average of five days to see the update and then to install. And the reason for that is, um, I, I just don't drive the car very much. It, it sits here, Alyssa drives it sometimes, and I just update it whenever I notice on the app that there's something new to go. And I've, I'm one of those that I set the car to advance. I like to get all the new stuff right away. And even if uh, some of the new updates are a little buggy, which they certainly can be, I don't mind working through some of those bugs. And that brings us to our battery report. Oh, this is the best. Now. The first thing I want to mention here is how this chart works. This chart looks at every completed charge here and then it measures, okay, what does the car predict would be full? It's not every full charge. It's okay. You charge it to 50%. You charge it to 90%. What would it actually be if it was full? It's a, it's a metric the car communicates each time. And that's why you see these big fluctuations. It goes down, it comes up. And this is all BMS calibration going in and out of sync. And this is just the nature of battery packs. The car never truly knows how much energy is in the battery pack at any given time. This is why you can never have an app that shows, yes, your battery's in good health or bad health accurately. It will give you a good general understanding of degradation, but it is not true. So that's what I like about this chart is it compiles the data over every charging session and eventually you start to see trends of how your battery is degrading. So when the car was new, you can see our starting range. This is the first starting charge. The car predicted 310.28 miles on a charge and that's a rated range. Of course, you'll never get that on the highway, but this is the car I think is rated for 245 watt hour per mile, somewhere around there. Uh, you know, given 74 kilowatt hours of usable capacity gives you 310 miles plus or minus. That's how it's calculated. Now my current range on the most recent charge this morning, the car is predicting 287.06 miles. Um, so it is predicting 23 miles of lost range and 8% degradation. Now, if we look at our highest range the car has seen, which was 312 miles, again, the BMS is always moving around getting confused, versus our lowest range, 285 miles, that would indicate a 9.24% loss. And this is why I'm saying you can never look at a full charge rated range and say, oh, I have... 310 miles left on my car. I have 290 miles. And so let me divide that versus what it's rated for and look at my degradation. It's not how it works. Uh, it gives you a good general range, but it's not your actual degradation. And so um, what I did to test this, which will be the, the next part of this video, is I did what I believe to be truly the only and best way you can test usable capacity of your battery pack. Now, when this car was new, this car pulled 74 kilowatt hours from 100% to dead. 
And so what I did is I went to go could do the same exact test and I will follow or you can follow me along on this test right now and see how I performed it, uh, how I was able to minimize the amount of heat loss, how I was able to minimize the amount of phantom drain on the car so you can see our accurate uh, degradation test. And then we can compare it to these numbers here and see if this trend is accurate or not. And you now join me in the Model 3 at the Rocky Mount Supercharger, and we are charging up to 100%. It's actually a totally full supercharger. That never happens. Uh, what I'm doing, though, is I'm waiting in the car. In case someone shows up, I'll move, let them charge, and take the next available spot. Um, because we're not charging to get places, we're charging for a test, and we uh, should not take priority over someone who needs to get places in their Tesla. So what we're doing is uh, we are charging up from about 88% to 100%. It was a little chilly last night, 73 degrees outside right now. And what I'm going to do by doing it here at the supercharger is heat up the whole battery, heat up the drivetrain. And what that means is when we're doing our degradation test, which is what this is, we're gonna drive nice and slow and easy, you know, 65, 70 miles per hour, no hard accelerations, no burning off as heat loss. And we're gonna look at the total number of kilowatt hours consumed from 100% to when the car won't move at zero. Now, when the car was new, this car was able to pull 74 kilowatt hours out of the battery pack. What are we gonna see now? I definitely would be surprised if it's in that high 60 range. I think we'll maybe see mid 60s. Um, yeah, only time will tell. Let's charge it up to 100%. I also have the car pre-conditioning for supercharging. And what that will do is it's also heating up the battery. So hopefully by the time we hit 100% in about 15, 20 minutes or so, everything will be nice and warm. The afterburners will not have to run once we go and we'll reset our trip and look at the total number of kilowatt hours total energy consumed over our time. Now this is not gonna be a range test, although in a sense I guess we'll get our range, but it's more about the battery capacity. Let's do it. So I think I should go a little more in depth as to why we're doing this test while driving. You know, doesn't the car know how much energy is in the battery pack and it tells you you have, you know, 290 miles on a full charge or whatever it is, we're gonna look to see what this car thinks. Uh, the answer is it has a good idea, but it is not perfect. You see, the BMS is always getting confused. It's moving up and down. It's trying to figure out what's going on in the battery pack. Uh, and this car should be relatively accurate because it sees high state of charge for our road trips and it gets run all the way down. So it should be fairly calibrated. Um, but again, you don't truly know unless you do the test and see what you can pull out of the battery pack. And one thing I was uh, thinking about as well, um, what we're going to be looking at here is battery that's been consumed by the car, energy that's been consumed by the car while we are moving, and we're going to get a kilowatt hour number. What that doesn't show is the heat loss uh, used by driving the car, which is still usable capacity. We've just burned it off. Of course, if we were driving in winter with consumption being higher, we would have higher heat loss, so less energy available to use. If we were on the racetrack, we'd have a lot of heat loss. You know, the drivetrain gets hot. Uh, that's available, usable energy that's being burnt off as excess heat. And I believe it's I squared R. So the heat uh, loss, or basically your your loss of energy increases by the squared amount, so it's a logarithmic curve of the amount of current that you pull. And so what we're gonna do is try to just gently accelerate uh, all around, but we'll probably have some heat loss. Now, Bjorn, who we all know Bjorn Nyland, who's a great um, electric vehicle reviewer, journalist, uh, really good in-depth tests. Uh, been watching him since he started. I'm one of the OG Bjorn fans, of course. He's probably the only other electric vehicle YouTuber that I watch. Sorry, I really don't watch many car videos. And um, what Bjorn did in his current test is since he has scanned my Tesla, he was able to calculate roughly the heat loss on a 100% to 3% test, and he roughly figured about a half a kilowatt hour. So whatever number we get, I'm going to roughly add about a half a kilowatt hour to, uh, to try and get the most accurate number, because of course we'll have some loss burnt off as heat. That's also why I'm trying to warm this drivetrain up ahead of time so that it's already warm, there's less resistance in the pack when things are warm, 
energy likes to flow. So that's why we're preconditioning for supercharging while supercharging to 100%. It's all to minimize the heat loss. All right, we are at 100%. We're still doing seven kilowatts. So there is some energy at the top of this pack and we're gonna go until it completes. So we may be here for another 20 minutes by the time it completes at 100%. Let's take a look to see how much range the car thinks we have, 287 miles. Again, that said 310 when the car was new. Um, and the performances were downgraded, I think to 299. I don't know if this car has that software or not. I never run my car in miles doesn't really matter what matters is how much energy we can pull out but pretty interesting to see that this thing only full charges let's just say to 288 289 290 um, by the time it actually completes because again if it's doing seven kilowatt it means there's quite a bit of headroom in this battery pack still all right we are completed let's uh deg test we're just going to reset just in case there we go that's our degradation test time to head out and uh, drain it. Next time this car gets plugged in, it'll be totally dead and uh, we will be off. Let's do it. We're gonna try and keep the speeds as low as possible. Of course, ideally we'd only go 30, 45, maybe 50 miles per hour. Um, and that would be the best because you have the less resistance. The car is not having to push through the air, uh, you know, put more current out. So more heat loss, of course, by driving quickly, but it's really not safe to do less than 65 70 miles an hour around where i live so we're gonna go uh 70 miles per hour maximum speed but of course i'm gonna try and keep it as low as possible and i'm already factoring a half a kilowatt hour so 500 watt hour uh for a heat loss number that's what we're gonna go off of we'll see if it works out uh, but i'm already going as slow as i feel safe people are just blowing by us and again we're we're pretty accurate here we don't need to get every last you know, 10th of a percent. I just got a great question in. If you don't follow our Instagram, at the end of this video, we are compiling a Q&A section that will go through basically all of the questions you guys ask. And a lot of them we're answering throughout the video, but things that aren't answered in the one year ownership report, I will then answer in the Q&A at the end of this video. But one question came up, are, are there any squeaks and rattles in the car? And the answer is yes. Uh, when I got the car, there was a rattle. I can't remember where it was. I'll have to go back in the service records. You probably would have seen this. And it was just something minor and they fixed it. It may not have even had made it on a service record. But now the back seat has developed a rattle that over, especially small undulations and bumps, it creaks really loudly back there. And it has something to do with the latch in the back seat. Now my last Model 3, my rear wheel drive, which I also did a 60,000 mile one year ownership update on, that car had the exact same problem from new, from when I bought it. And uh, Tesla was never able to fix it. And so, yeah, I'm not even gonna bother bringing this one in because it's such a minor problem. And for the most part, this is our road trip car. The rear seats are down with the dogs in the back, therefore probably not needed to fix it. It doesn't happen with the rear seats down. We are now at 50% state of charge. I've been trying to drive on these back roads, going slow to minimize heat loss as much as possible. And we have certainly <laughs> gone pretty late in the day, uh, but we also, again, stopped to put the car on the lift. Then we got a little snack. So all is good. The one thing we don't want to do though, is let the car sit for a long period of time for phantom drain. And yes, now we're in night mode. Anyway, 50% state of charge and 35 kilowatt hours on our degradation test. Um, also, we're going to try and be easy on regen. We're just doing this the proper way and we'll see how much, but this would indicate 70 kilowatt hours on a full charge, which would be incredible. So we'll have to see how it does. We are finally nearing the end of the degradation test. We are at 3% state of charge, just cruising down the highway at 60 miles an hour. Uh, predicted arrival at 2% at Rocky Mount. It'll probably be right between 1% and 2%. Uh, so far, we've driven 264.8 miles. Uh, watt hour per mile is 249, which is really low. You can see lifetime is 333. I really tried to keep it slow and steady this trip just to minimize heat loss. It's taken almost all day to do this test, but it is an important test and it is the only true way to measure degradation. So far, we've pulled 66 kilowatt hours from the pack. Uh, it's been on 66 for a while. What I'm going to do is monitor this number here. Uh, for example, when it tips up to 67, and if we're on 67 for a while, when the car dies, then we'll count it as 68. If it just tips over, then we'll count it as 
five. And so uh, there is gonna be a little margin of error because again, I'm adding half a kilowatt hour for heat loss and other phantom drain because the car's been parked uh, not very long, but you know, three or four times for very short periods of time. I'd say at least had a half a kilowatt hour of uh, loss during this, this test, especially over 266 miles of driving. So we're gonna run up to the supercharger, drive around on back roads until it's dead. The thing is when this is zero, and if the car doesn't shut off, then that means that there's a buffer at the bottom that we can still use, that's still usable battery that needs to be counted. That's why you can't go off this percentage. Now, conversely, if the BMS is not calibrated on this car, these dots may just go all the way to the left here and we may just completely lose power. That's why you see Teslas that tow a lot or on heavy use sometimes just run out with battery percentage remaining. And it's because the voltage is constantly getting pulled from the current and the BMS can't keep up and it basically under voltages the power things get confused over time and that's why you can't trust BMS signals not only for range degradation but also your real-time percentage we may not actually be at 2% what is very accurate seemingly though is this power ramp down dots in the Model S they give you a kilowatt limit in the Model 3 it's just an arbitrary you know, dots on the screen, but we can see if it gets really close to the center, I'm gonna go ahead and plug into the supercharger because those tend to indicate that, hey, you're actually running out. We're still going at 0% and zero miles. The, this thing shows that it's dead, but it's still moving. We've tipped up to 68 kilowatt hours consumed and uh, it's still moving, so we're still going until the car really feels like we have severe performance degradation that's when we'll stop. Don't worry about me blowing through these stop signs. The police in this town have bigger things to worry about. We have come to an end. 68 kilowatt hours at zero miles. Of course, zero percent. It hit zero percent a while ago. And um, whoops, display, energy, zero percent. Percent definitely makes sense. Uh, we did 272.5 miles. Again, at varying speeds. Very nice typical degradation test. This is the only true way to do it. And uh, we drained this thing completely. So I'd say that's very good. Well, thanks for joining along on that long degradation test. But again, that's the best way to test usable capacity is 100 to zero, minimizing your heat loss in between. And I still think it was pretty smart that we warmed everything up on the supercharger by navigating to the charger to make sure everything was as accurate and as warm as possible. And we, uh, again, we were able to pull 68 kilowatt hours indicated. We're gonna say 68.5, but again, that's around seven and a half. So I would say percent degradation. And I would say that's gonna be a range between 6.8 and 8.5 or so percent degradation, somewhere around there which is a lot higher than I think people would have expected. We did a poll on our Twitter and many people said 3%, 4%. Well, no, this car gets driven on the racetrack. It gets supercharged a lot. Even though I take care of the battery as best as possible, charging it to 50% and leaving it, charging it no more than 80% daily. It never sits with a high state of charge, never sits with a low state of charge. It sits in the middle where it's happy around 30 to 50% most of the time. Um, we still supercharge this car a lot. It still gets driven hard on track and it still goes on very, very long trips in varying temperature conditions. And so I would say our trend here is very accurate on Tesla Fi to what we're seeing. It's predicting uh, an 8% loss. We said, what, seven and a half, seven point four 7.4 or so. And that is right around uh, plus or minus about the same. And I added again, a little bit of capacity uh, into the battery for that heat loss. So if we may have figured uh, you know, we didn't calculate our heat loss. It'd be right there at 8%. And uh, yeah, pretty cool. Now you can see all of our included data points. Every completed charge this car has had, all 600 and however many there were. And this is an interesting graph. This will show us the amount of times that the car has been charged to each percentage level. So in our year, I've only 100% charged this car 16 times been 99% charged six times. Usually that's like, oh, I'm plugged in. Let me unplug and then we go. It's never charged to 100% and sat there. It's always 100% get in the car and pull it down to at least 90 or below. It's been 90% charged 163 times. It's been 80% charged nearly 100 times. It's been 70% charged 25 and a whole bunch in the middle. And of course you can stop this video anytime to see the graph. 
Now you are probably interested, well, you can only set the slider in the car to 50% charge. You can see it's done that 26 times. To complete, how are you able to stop charging below? Well, this counts um, non-completed charging sessions as well. This is every time the car has been charged and unplugged. So you can see we've unplugged it at 6%, 8%, 15%, 5% times. Um, so this is just the total chart of charges. And I love this data. This is why I love Tesla Phi. So we hit you hard with a ton of charging, a ton of cost. We've gone through the video. We're into this thing for like almost an hour now. What do you say we do some Q and A from our Instagram? I'm gonna pull up my phone and just run through the questions that you all have asked me about uh, the ownership with my car. So let's do that. We seriously received hundreds of these questions on our Instagram and I'm just gonna run through and answer them. Uh, are you thinking about purchasing another Tesla? Yes, I would like a Model Y, but with that much uh, loss in value in one year, it doesn't make sense to get another one and lose another $20,000. If we have a ton of Patreons supporting us, maybe, but I really want to get uh, maybe a used Taycan coming up or something. We'll probably always have a Tesla in the driveway, but I really want to experience some non-Tesla cars as well with big batteries. Of course, our i3 and Smart, but we don't really drive those except around town. Um, Range anxiety, if you had it, how did you overcome it just time? I've never once had range anxiety with this car or with any of my other Teslas. Uh, big battery, of course, helps, but also the best way to increase your range is just to slow down. You always know where you're going to go because the navigation does a great job of routing you through superchargers. I have plug share to show every level two destination. I would say though, the probably the closest we've come to what I would consider to be range anxiety is during this summer road trip that we just took with the roof box, with the car fully loaded, with the dogs, we had to go from Sioux Falls, South Dakota to Fargo, North Dakota. And if you follow our Twitter, of course, you would have seen us post about this. And uh, that was a long stretch. We had to drive, I think, at 60 or 65 miles per hour, but we made it no problem. Uh, how bad are the rattles in the car? Well, if you watch our degradation portion, you will see I talked about that. There's one rattle coming from the rear. And we have another uh, question about rattles, of course. I'm not going to go through everything. I'll just go through the ones that we haven't covered. And um, how did suspension stuff like bushings and ball joints hold up? We look too, they look really good. Nothing seems torn, nothing seems worn. It seems pretty nice. How has the out of warranty life treated you with Tesla? Any major repairs? Well, uh, the windshield would have never been covered under warranty anyway, but that was pretty good. It brought in the service, took them about a week to do the windshield. They had to take the uh, crossbars off and they couldn't find the keys in the car. But also there were some communication issues where I didn't know they weren't able to get it done. So I'm like a week later, like, when's my car going to be done? They're like, oh, you need this key. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, other than that, I have some seat controls that they had promised to fix, but they're still not fixed and they haven't come here to fix it yet. So the passenger seat can't be moved because we ripped those switches off, but that's our fault really. And we're just going to pay them to fix that. Uh, have you ever regretted uh, for using an electric car? I guess uh, maybe a language translation there, but do we regret having an EV? Absolutely not. We love our EVs. I will say as a general car enthusiast, again, some of our other channels like One Lap and Out of Spec Reviews, we cover all cars. I do miss the sense of enjoyment of driving a true vehicle that makes noise with three pedals from time to time. And so I'd love to get a Morgan three-wheeler for the weekends or something really raw and exciting uh, just to, to cure that car guy fuzz in me, more or less. Uh, any major service? How are the brake pads and how was the coolant after Death Valley? Yes, we've had this car in crazy hot temperatures, 123, 125 degrees, and it never had a problem. Coolant looks good. All levels are fine. The car is happy. Senna Fizzle asks, I'd like to know what you think Tesla needs to add to keep their lead to other EV automakers. This is a great question. Uh, right now, Tesla, I think, has really nailed it with the integration of their charging networks. And this is why road trips are so easy for what we do. You put in your destination, it routes you through the chargers, and you get there with zero range anxiety. Uh, I think that is the biggest separator to not the future of transportation or any of this stuff, but from an actual user's perspective, you get into a Audi e-tron or a Tesla Model X and you say, let me go to 
Denver from North Carolina, the Tesla routes you through everything. And the Audi should do this, but it also makes you stop at Nissan dealers and charge at AC rather than prioritizing DC chargers. So the route planner is really good. Of course, there's a service called a better route planner. I use it all the time when I road trip non-Teslas and it does a really good job of getting you from A to B. But I'd say that's probably the biggest thing auto other automakers need. But the question wasn't that. The question was, what does Tesla need to keep up with other automakers? And I think a lot of it just comes down to overall fit and finish, but not in the way most people think. When I drive some of these German electric cars, like I just got out of Taycan and e-tron in the last few weeks, those cars drive like bank vaults. There's a sense of solidity to them. There's a sense that this car is carved out of one single piece of metal. Teslas do not give you that feeling. I think the steering ratio in Model 3 and especially Model Y is too quick. They need to back that off uh, because especially if you pop out of autopilot, the car jerks around and I've seen so many people not familiar with the system almost cause car accidents because of this. James asked, how is the paint at the back of the rear door sill? Uh, it's not bad on this car. My rear wheel drive got all pitted up. This one certainly has a couple marks and from rocks and stuff, but it's really not bad. Uh, has it ever seen rain? Talk about every time we drive the car. You guys know we see rain on every out-of-spec road trip. Yes. Uh, how parts hold up over time? Repairs like brakes, suspension, wear and tear. Well, the car is still new. It's only 60,000 miles. It's a Tesla. It should last a really long time. So far, I've done no maintenance on the vehicle. Never once brought it in for general maintenance whatsoever. Uh, what miles did I do tire rotations? I don't. I tend to just chew through them every 1,000 or 1,500 miles on the track and then put a new set of cheap tires on it. So uh, it's had a ton of different tires, ton of different wheels, but I, I really don't want to report on that because it's not representative of how a normal person would use their vehicle. Someone asked, what is my normal job? Well, what does that have to do with the Tesla? You're looking at it. I'm an automotive journalist. We have our own outlets. I also work for Inside EVs. And uh, yeah, we just review cars all the time. It's really fun. We have a small team of uh, editor, videographer, myself, and our social media coordinator. And uh, yeah, we're just making cool videos for you guys. Here's an interesting one. Have the auto wipers gotten any better? Maybe a little bit better, but they still suck. They go on way too fast when they see a little bit of rain. When it rains a lot, they don't go on fast enough. I don't know what Tesla has been thinking for years, taking a rain sensor out of the car, thinking they can do this with vision. It really makes me angry. Just put a 68 cent rain sensor in there, refracted light sensor, make the wipers work like AP1 cars do. This is so stupid. I don't, someone, I'm sure someone got fired over this, but the fact that they even sold cars for like six months that didn't even have auto wipers because they were like, we can do this with vision, that's, it's just dumb. And so many questions about how the interior is holding up, general stuff. I think we answered pretty much every question throughout this video. So many people wanted to know about degradation. I mean, literally probably 150 alone. Words. How much capacity has been lost? What's the degradation? Uh, how's the supercharging affected your car? And I think we've gone through that and we've gone over time. This is a long video. My voice hurts from talking. And um, I really appreciate you guys sticking around for this long, watching out of spec motoring. It's only gonna get crazier. We are doing a ton more adventures. If you haven't figured it out by now, we've been towing and we've done this little camping thing, all in preparation for some bigger trips in electric cars all around the world as soon as we're able to when borders open. If you're watching this in the future, this video was filmed in October 2020, so some of the figures and numbers are going to be off by the time you watch it, such as the car's value, for example. And if you'd like to see another one of these next year, if we have the car for another year, at this rate, I don't see why not. It doesn't really cost us anything to drive it. Free supercharging, and it's lost a lot of value, so I'm not going to take the hit. Um, we'll probably add another EV to the fleet. We're thinking XC40 Recharge. We're thinking e-tron. We're thinking Taycan Sport Turismo, if we get a lot of Patreons. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see. But I definitely want to get another serious EV um, that's, that's like a world-class car, just to see how it competes with Tesla. So thanks for watching. We'll hope to see you on the next one. And please like and subscribe. I know I don't ask, but it would mean a lot to us. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.